All right. Good morning, everyone. Take your Bibles and turn to Mark for me. Mark chapter 15. Mark chapter 15. We're going to be in verses 20b. We'll read all of 20, but we'll focus on the second half of it. Um, 20 through 32 this morning. So Mark 15, 20 through 32. The title of the message this morning is The Crucified King. Last week we looked at The Condemned King. This week we look at The Crucified King. Mark chapter 15, verses 20 through 32. And if you would stand with me in honor of the one who gave us this word as we read it together this morning. Mark 15, verse 20 begins, And after they had mocked him, they took the purple robe off him and put his own garments on him, and they led him out to crucify him. And they pressed into service a passerby coming from the countryside, Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. And they brought him to a place called Golgotha, which is translated place of a skull. And they tried to give him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided up his garments among themselves, casting lots for them to decide who should take what. No, it was the third hour and they crucified him. And the inscription of the charge against him read the king of the Jews. And they crucified two robbers with him, one on his right and one on his left. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, and he was numbered with transgressors. And those passing by were blaspheming him, shaking their heads and saying, ha, you who are going to destroy the sanctuary and rebuild it in three days, save yourself by coming down from the cross. In the same way, mocking him to one another, the chief priests also, along with the scribes, were saying, he saved others, he cannot save himself. Let this Christ, the King of Israel, now come down from the cross so that we may see and believe those who were crucified with him were also insulting him. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful to be here today as a body. We're thankful for your grace um, in regenerating us, justifying us, continuing to sanctify us by leading us together as a body under your command. And we pray, Lord, that this text would impact each of us with the reality of sin, the weight and gravity of sin. Help us to be sobered by what the Son of God went through to atone for his people. I pray, Lord, that you would remove any distractions from me, any hindrances, um, the weights of this week, um, the stresses. And I just pray that you would use me simply as a mouthpiece for your word and that your spirit would apply this text to my heart and mind and to all those who hear it in their heart and mind. We pray all these things by your grace and for your glory in your name. Amen. All right, you can be seated. So last week we talked about the condemned king and we got through verse 20, the first part of verse 20. Uh, and they had taken the purple robe off. And if you, if you recall the, the, the drama behind removing the, the robe off of the wounds and things that he had from the scourging. And so we left off with him weak, beaten, mocked, and back in his clothes of his own. And now they're going to take him to, uh, to complete the task of capital punishment, despite his innocence. So they're going to complete what they were told by Pilate, which was take him and crucify him. So he is about to, Jesus is about to walk the last steps of his earthly mission in what is to be probably the most excruciatingly difficult steps for his human body to take. Throughout all the travel that we've seen throughout Mark, all of his ministry, these last few steps from the court to Golgotha will be the most difficult. Um, but Mark, is, as we talked about last week, is focusing in chapter 15 on the mental and internal toll, uh, the internal struggle that comes from the intense mocking, um, the intense um, laughter and, and, and ridicule of those he has been tried before. Um, and now will be deepened even further um, as his physical body has now been mercilessly, mercilessly excuse me, beaten, um, and he's forced to carry something all the way to his place of death. And then if not, uh, if the cross was not enough, he's going to be mocked by every passerby that sees him. 
So it's, it's important to remember as we go through here, and I want to set the tone for the message right up front. Um, it's important that we remember what Hebrew t- Hebrews tells us about Christ, um, is that he was tempted just as we are, yet without sin, that he, he is not unfamiliar with our weaknesses. Hebrews 4.15 reads, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things like we are, yet without sin. Remember that he wore humanity in its entirety. He was 100% human without the impact of sin. And so understanding that he has faced as a man the ridicule, the mocking, the spitting, people calling for his death, everyone doubting who he is, who he claims to be, and facing them with the weaknesses, not sin, but weaknesses of being a human in that regard. And so I want you to keep that in the back of your mind as we go through this step by step for the the actual crucifixion of Christ um, and understanding what that would entail, the weight of that. And Mark was going to make several connections throughout our text today from the Old Testament. Um, He's made several already. We've we've highlighted those, but he's going to make several more. And the majority of them are going to be based on the suffering righteous man the suffering righteous man. So there's several Psalms, there's several places in the Old Testament that simply speaks about a righteous man suffering unjustly, a righteous man suffering for no reason of his own. And Mark is going to make several points to connect us with Christ as the ultimate suffering righteous man, someone who did no wrong but suffered nonetheless. Um, And so we'll see this, this text as Uh, We'll see throughout this text as Jesus as the the Messiah Savior that we talked about when we first introduced Mark. Um, We'll see him on on both the highest level of of physical and mental pain, suffering, uh, pain and suffering the world has to offer, and yet enduring tour till the end. My tongue is not working today. Enduring till the end. And really what I want us to wrap our minds around is ultimately he did this staying true to the Father's will. And that's going to be a point of application for us. He stayed true to this, even though in the garden he prayed, not my will. In other words, he, this is not something he enjoyed to endure, but endured nonetheless for the Father's will, for the sake of his people. And then next week, of course, we'll talk about the Redeemer King and what he did for us. But today we're going to focus on the crucified King. So number one, leading the King. Leading the King, verses 20b through 23. So we'll pick up in the second part of verse 20. And they led him out to crucify him, and they pressed into service a passerby coming from the countryside, Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. Then they brought him to the place Golgotha, which is translated place of a skull. And they tried to give him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided, or excuse me, and he did not take it. So at this point, it's time to take him out of the city. As I mentioned, they've they've scourged him, they've mocked him, um, they've they've given him, quote unquote, the royal treatment, but in a mocking fashion. Um, They are doing everything they can, the Romans have done everything they can to, to, to take away from who he is in reality. And now the sovereign king of the universe, the creator, the one who stains everything with his hands is being led. Think about that for just a moment. The king, sovereign creator is being led by his creation. There's a heavy weight to that thought. He's being led by his creation to his ultimate death. And so picking up in the end of verse 20, they led him out to crucify him. Now, the Romans really only did crucifixions outside of the city in most cases. Um, They didn't do just crucifixions in Jerusalem. This was a a Rome-wide custom. And as was the custom, they would march them to their final death, and and they would have the the accused, the the convicted, carry the crossbeam of their cross upon their back. Um, and, and no records that I could find did Rome ever make them carry the entire cross where it had already been attached together. It was simply the cross beam. Still a very heavy beam, but a cross beam nonetheless. And so to, to give you an idea of what this crucifixion is going to be, I wanted to give you some, some historical background on crucifixions. 
The form, this particular form of execution was reserved by Rome only for those who were not Roman citizens. It was considered too grotesque and too cruel and too inhumane to be put onto anyone that was considered a Roman citizen. So no matter how bad you acted as a Roman citizen, this punishment would not come on you. This was generally reserved for slaves, violent criminals, and prisoners of war. And so Jesus, they felt, fell into that category. And, and to understand the full scope of Roman crucifixion, Cicero, who was uh, around about 40 years before Christ, called it the most cruel and horrifying punishment. Um, the, the Rome's goal was to inflict the most amount of pain possible while simultaneously bestowing on the recipient the absolute highest level of disgrace and shame. Uh, in fact, Quintilian was quoted as saying, whenever we crucify the guilty, the most crowded roads are chosen where the most people can see and be moved by this fear. They were intent on getting the largest number of people to witness what was happening to the convicted to cause the most amount of fear so that that would not happen to them as well. In fact, Rome, um, with the, the um, insurrection, um, they will often treat insurrectionists with crucifixion. Spartacus, the, the largest crucifixion ever, um, the rebellion of Spartacus, the, the Rome actually crucified some 6,000 slaves, and they did it ro on the road between Capua and Rome, and they did it every few feet so that the entire road you could see had crucified people on it to keep people from causing insurrections. So the point of this is to bring extreme pain, suffering, and disgrace to the convicted, trying their best to keep others from doing the same thing. And they didn't practice the crucifixion the same way every time. Um, in fact, the centurion who would be in charge of the, usually it's four soldiers and one centurion that would carry out a crucifixion, they were actually competing with each other in a way to see who could be more sadistic. Um, they would position the bodies in different ways using different tools. Sometimes they would tie the arms up. Sometimes they would wrap the legs around the back and cr crucify and put the nails in from the backside. So you're essentially your legs would be wrapped around behind you. There was all kinds of ways. And they would brag to one another the most sadistic way and the most pain that they could cause. Sometimes they used nails. Sometimes they just simply tied them up. But the goal of the crucifixion was not a fast death. In fact, Christ's death on the cross was fairly quick compared to normal crucifixions, the average person lasted three to five days. And the, the goal of the, the, the cross was not to bleed someone out. In fact, the, the, the Romans prided themselves on knowing anatomy well enough to not hit a major vein or artery so that the, the person wouldn't die more quickly than they wanted them to. The normal cause of death would be from hypovolemic shock, which is lack of circulation because their body simply couldn't circulate anymore. Um, or they would die from exhaustion asphyxia. So in other words, that they couldn't pull themselves up to breathe anymore because your lungs have to expand. And so as the more tired you got and the body weight pulled down, every breath required you to pull yourself up against either the nail or the ties to pull yourself up enough to expand your lungs to get a breath. And then you would fall back down and essentially hold your breath until you had enough strength to pull yourself back up again. Or they would die of heart failure, which would come from either one of those other items. So this death was designed to be the ultimate sadistic, torturous death for the lowest classes and worst of criminals. And yet this is exactly what the creator of the universe is now being led to. He has faced the mocking and the scourging as if that wasn't enough, and now he is being led. The creator of the universe is being led to face the most twisted death of its time that sinful man could come up with. And so now that we have a good grasp on what he was walking towards, let's pick up in verse 21. And they pressed into service a passerby coming from the countryside. So recall, Jesus has now been stripped of his flesh from the scourging, beaten mul multiple times, all in the matter of a few hours. And they have strapped the patabellum, 
The patabellum is what they would call the crossbeam. And they've strapped that to them. They've begun walking what's now known as um, the, the Via della Rosa, the, the, the path that Jesus walked from and through Jerusalem. And so as they're walking down through here, undoubtedly, Mark doesn't give us a lot of detail, but we can only assume that he's unable to carry it, whether it be from falling, not being able to get up, or, or stumbling, or, or whatever the case may be, but he's, he's unable to carry it. And so they press this Cyrene. Cyrene is a city on the coast of North Africa, and they, they press Simon in to carrying the patabolum the rest of the way. Now, it's, it's interesting to note here for just a moment that Mark makes a little author's note and puts in parentheses the father of Alexander and Rufus. That tells us that whoever Mark is writing this gospel to doesn't necessarily know Simon, but knows his sons. And so it's just a way of communicating, hey, this is, this is Rufus's dad. Um, and in fact, Paul in, in Romans 16, 13 mentions a Rufus in Rome. Very likely it's the son of Simon, the Cyrene. Um, and so th it's, it's assumed that these two men are part of the church in Rome, um, likely because of the impact that perhaps Jesus made on Simon during this time. It's hard to say. There's not a lot of detail there, but there's connections throughout Scripture about the sons of Simon. So this man from Cyrene becomes a physical representation of what Jesus commanded his disciples to do in Mark 8, 34. If you recall, Jesus told his disciples after summoning them to himself, he says, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. So now Simon is physically giving us that representation, the first person to physically show us what that looks like. And so they forced Simon to carry the cross beam the rest of the way to the place of a skull, or Golgotha. In Latin, they use the term Calvary, which means scalp, scalp or bald head. So the word Calvary, if you've ever wondered where that came from, it's Latin to mean the same thing. So now he's at Calvary, he's at Golgotha. And just imagine this man from Africa carrying this cross beam up with this beaten, bruised, bleeding man from Nazareth, where there's likely a crowd. It's not far from the city. There's, there's a couple different locations in, in modern day Palestine that they claim to be the place outside of Jerusalem where Jesus was crucified. Some say it's over on a hill. That's a little bit farther from the city, but there's really convincing archeological evidence that the church of the Holy Sepulcher is built on top of where Jesus would have been crucified. Um, very convincing archaeological evidence, which is right outside the city, if you know anything about the modern day pieces. So the, the, the goal of the Romans was not to get the, the, the convicted too far from the city, because if they wanted to make an example of him, if they got too far away, nobody would see it. And it was always on the heaviest traveled road, at least as much, much as they could manage that. They wanted to be close to a heavily tra traveled road. And remember, this is Passover. How many millions of people are now in Jerusalem? So we have people traveling to and from on Jerusalem in the, the busiest and most crowded time of the year in this city. And they've marched him through the most heavily populated, per the Roman custom, the most heavily populated portion of the street so that most people could see him. And now he's arrived at this place, likely barely able to walk for he can't even carry the cross beam. And now he's arrived at the place of a skull. And what's interesting is when he first arrives, they try to give him wine mixed with myrrh. Now, if, if you're familiar with myrrh at all, you might understand that this is an early uh, attempt at a narcotic. So essentially, they were trying to give him something to deaden the pain. Um, now, Jesus rejects this. Um, there's been speculation why he may have rejected it. Um, the, the, the most convincing thought is he, he promised not to, to drink wine again until the coming of the new kingdom. And so he likely rejected it for that. But there's also the aspect of it. I think that Jesus was fully committed to the Father's will and embracing the suffering that he was destined to suffer from before the foundations of the earth for his people in all of its entirety. In other words, 
Corinth, he wanted to be fully conscious, conscious for what was coming. There was going to be no deadening of this suffering. He came to do this for his people, and he was going to fully embrace that. This particular mention of him offering this comes from Psalm 69, 21, where it says, they also gave me gall for my food and for my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. Again, pointing to the righteous man who's suffering unjustly. If you read Psalm 69 in its entirety, you see over and over again, the suffering man, the story of the righteous man who's suffering through no fault of his own, that people simply take advantage of him and cause him to suffer. So we have here the king of the universe making this slow march to his ultimate death in the most brutal fashion that depraved man could come up with in that day and time. And he's arrived. And we move to point number two, mocking the king. Now you may think, Josh, why is point number two mocking the king? Isn't he about to be crucified? Well, I'll show you the way Mark writes it, that his point is not the crucifixion, his point is the mocking. So let's read verses 24 through 32 again together. And they crucified him and divided up his garments among themselves, casting lots for them to decide who should take what. Now it was the third hour and they crucified him. And the inscription on, of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. And they crucified two robbers with him, one on his right and one on his left. And the, scriptures, the scripture was fulfilled, which says, and he was numbered with transgressors. And those passing by were blaspheming him, shaking their heads and saying, ha, you who are going to destroy the sanctuary and rebuild it in three days. Save yourself by coming down from the cross. In the same way, mocking him to one another, the chief priests also, along with the scribes, were saying, he saved others, he cannot save himself. Let this Christ, the King of Israel, now come down from the cross so that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him were also insulting him. So Mark doesn't elaborate on the brutality of the physical crucifixion. In fact, in verse 24, it simply says, and they crucified him. Mark's point in the way he's wording this is not to focus on the physical brutality of the crucifixion itself. Mark is giving us the element that some of the other gospel writers don't, which is the mockery that was thrown at him. And so they crucified him and they divided him the, up his clothes, casting lots for them. Now, it's, it, we don't know for sure when he was crucified, whether they actually used nails or whether they tied his hands and then raised him up. Um, and there's, there's lots of different ways they could have done that. Sometimes they would attach the cross beam on the ground and raise the entire thing up in its entirety. Sometimes they would have the cross beam where it was supposed to go, and they would simply attach the person to it and raise them up and then attach the feet at the bottom. There's really no way to know specifically what form or process they used for him. But the Gospels don't record whether they nailed him to it. The only evidence that we have for the tradition that nails were used is in John verse 20, or chapter 20 and verse 27 when he appeared to Downing Thomas and he said, look here at the wounds in my hands. So that's, that's the only indication that we have in Scripture that nails were used. Um, and it, it would make sense based on Jesus' reaction there. But ultimately, he's been raised up, and now they're dividing his clothes with another reference to Psalm twenty-two, eighteen. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Again, a psalm that is entirely filled with a righteous man suffering. So if you remember, when, when those psalms were written, they were written from the perspective of the person who felt themselves righteous, who were being persecuted for no reason. And now we see these actually apply ultimately to the Antitype, which is Christ, the true righteous man, the only one that is truly righteous, suffering at the hands of his own creation in the most depraved manner possible. So here he is with his clothes being divided up among the Romans, meaning that he was quite likely naked for his 
crucifixion. There is some argument that the Jews, based on their religious beliefs, would request at least a loincloth. But this was designed, again, to be the most degrading experience possible for the convicted. So as they're raising him up, Mark makes a note in verse 25 that it was the third hour when they crucified him. The third hour on the Roman calendar would have been 9 a.m. They consider the first hour to be 6 a.m. So at 9 a.m. in the morning, after having been arrested the night before, dragged off to a Jewish court in the middle of the night, mocked and beaten, convicted among the Jews who did not follow even their own law, marched to Pilate as early in the morning as they could possibly get him there, going through everything that, that Pilate put him through, questioning, conviction, hearing the crowd shout that they wanted him crucified, the false accusations about who he is. He's had his divinity attacked in front of the Jews. He's had his kingship attacked in front of the Romans. He was then scourged, beaten, given a false royal treatment to degrade him as much as humanly possible. Then he was marched up the road to his own death, so weakened by what has already occurred that he couldn't even carry the crossbeam. And now he's raised up with the charge, as required by Roman and Jewish law alike, raised up with the charge, the king of the Jews. Now, by God's providence, it's, it's actually really one of my favorite interactions of Pilate with anyone is in John 19 when the chief priests come to him and say, no, no, you can't put the king of the Jews. You need to put that he claims to be the king of the Jews. And Pilate says, what I've written, I've written. And so we know this was to the great consternation of the chief priests, but ultimately the sign is there, the charge has been given, he's been convicted, and he's now suffering for his perfection. And then Mark notes in verse 27 that they crucified two robbers with him, one on his right and one on his left. So he's counted amongst common thieves. And, and the word here for robbers in the original language could be used for a common thief, or this was also a term applied to insurrectionists, so that this, there is a, a chance, there's some argument that this could be cohorts of Barabbas, ultimately. Um, and if these were violent criminals, insurrectionists, it's no way for us to know for sure. But these, these two common criminals were here with the king of the universe as he's being raised up. And in verse 28, which verse 28, if your Bible has it in brackets, um, it's because it's a scribal note that was added sometime after Mark wrote his original gospel. But it does point to Isaiah 53, 12, where it says that he would be numbered with the transgressors. But if you read that verse in its entirety in Isaiah, it says, therefore, I will divide for him a portion with the many, and he will divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. Praise God that he was identified specifically with that suffering servant, for he is the one who would bear our sins. He is the one who would intercede, never facing death again at the right hand of God for those who are his. So now he's on the cross. We've, we've talked a lot about so far this morning the physical brutality of the crucifixion so that we can understand it, but now Mark is going to focus our attention on the mocking as there are several verses committed to all of these mockeries coming into a unified voice telling him that he is not who he says he is. So verse 29, and those passing by were blaspheming him, shaking their heads and saying, ha, you who are going to destroy the sanctuary and rebuild it in three days, save yourself by coming down from the cross. So these passerbys are most likely Jews. Remember Jerusalem, Passover, lots of people coming in and out. This idea of him destroying the temple gives you an idea uh, the, the, the Jews revolt against this idea of destroying the temple, gives you an idea of how highly they held and esteemed the temple itself. Not the God of the temple, but the physical temple itself. 
for that is the thing that has stuck with them throughout. It's the accusation they tried to use in front of the Jewish leaders. Now it's the, the common man passing by for Passover has even heard about it. This was, the, the, all indications point to this being a shockwave of sorts throughout the Jewish nation, that this man from Nazareth would say he would destroy the temple. And so they're using this to mock him, saying, if you were going to destroy the temple, can't you save yourself? If you're so good, if you're so big, if you're so mighty, if you have all this authority that you can say vocally that you're going to destroy the temple, why don't you just get yourself down from the cross? Why don't you just save yourself? Now, remember, I mentioned Hebrews 4 right at the beginning because I want us to understand that Jesus is not only 100% divine, but 100% human. And we know that this mental agony revealed itself because he knew what was coming in the garden, right? He, he, he sweated great drops of blood. This pressure, this, this idea of what he, he had coming before him was so much. Imagine the mental weight of that. Has anybody in here ever been exhausted and it affects you mentally? Can you imagine being beaten and exhausted? He's been up for 48 hours probably at this point, 36 at minimum. Beaten, exhausted, led through this, mocked re relentlessly. And now he's here hearing from the common man as they're simply walking by, just journeying there for Passover or going home from it. The mocking of the common man. And now Mark records that it's going to move back to the chief priests in verse 31. In the same way, mocking him to one another, the chief priests also, along with the scribes, so we have the Sanhedrin gathering here to witness the ultimate demise, the success of their plan that they've been conspiring for chapters now. And they were saying, he saved others, he cannot save himself. Let this Christ, the King of Israel, you can almost hear the tone in the language, let this Christ, the King of Israel, now come down from the cross so that we may see and believe. My goodness, they're still asking for a sign. After all that they've seen, they, they even admit that he's helped and healed people. They admit his ability to do miraculous things in their mocking. And yet they're still asking for a sign. The clear sign of the unbelief of these religious leaders is evidence in that asking. They're not looking to Christ and who he is. They're not looking to the sufferer. The, 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 there's no way that, that they didn't know the context of the text in Isaiah. There's no way. They had it memorized. I would be willing to lay down money. It was a requirement to memorize as much of the Old Testament as humanly possible. And Isaiah was one of the most popular books for the people of that day. And yet, with eyes that cannot see and ears that cannot hear, they still remain here asking for a sign as a way of mocking him. And now that they've mocked him again, Mark makes a note that even the criminals were insulting him. Those who were crucified him were also insulting him. Now we know from the other gospels that one of the men crucified next to him ultimately before his death did acknowledge who he was. But Mark notates here showing us the mocking of Christ that all of these groups now have melded into one voice, mocking the man on the cross from Nazareth, questioning his authority questioning who he is, mocking what he said he would do, insulting him at every possible moment. Nearly every person who is witness to this event, the pivotal moment in human history is mocking the very son of God. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Hebrews 4.15, I want you to think about what Christ was under with this mocking. Because remember, he still has the authority to call down legions of angels. That, that wasn't an option just at his arrest. He's the king of the, the, the universe. He still has that option. 
And yet, just like his prayer in the garden, when he said, not my will, but yours be done, he is enduring all of this for the sake of the elect. For the sake of the people that the father has chosen to give him. He endured all of this, none of which was his responsibility or his fault. None of that sin was his. He bore our transgressions and sins when we could not. He was the ransom for many, as Mark 10, 45 says. Because he didn't come to be served, but to serve. The ultimate act of service was him giving his life for those that he loved. This crucifixion and the mocking that it entails and the weight and the burden of of atoning for the sins of the many lets us understand truly the mystery of who Christ is, the great servant, not the great king to be served. Now, is he full of all honor and glory and should be served? Yes. But what I'm saying is in his incarnation, he came for one ultimate purpose, to serve, not to be served. So I want us to make sure we wrap our minds around that. Understanding his work was not one of self-help or self-fulfillment. He is here to save those who are his. Now, now that we've went through the crucifixion, I want to talk about an overarching motif that, that Mark has here, this overarching view of the crucifixion. Really, Mark has explained this in a way of of an enthronement of Jesus. He talks about the king of the Jews in front of Pilate, the royal treatment, the purple colors, the crown, the staff. And even with the parallel of the two thieves, one on his right and one on his left, parallels the sons of Zebedee's request to sit at the right hand and the left hand of him in glory. And so contrary to what men understand as royalty and kingship, Christ baffles the wisdom of man and enthrones himself in suffering, fulfilling the Father's will. How beautiful it is to see the perfect Lamb of God, when you understand it correctly, how beautiful it is for him to endure the royal mockery of the Romans, the the denial of his deity of the Jews, the mocking of the the common man walking by, all to be in, in reality enthroned above all of that before their very eyes. For he is the great crucified king who would bear the sins of the many. There's a quote I came across this week that I'd like to share with you that was too good for me to try to explain to you without simply reading it. It says, the taunt for Jesus to come down from the cross is in essence the same temptation that he faced faced in Gethsemane, but is to avoid the cup of suffering. At Gethsemane, Jesus made the costly decision, which he now fulfills, to do the will of God rather than his own will. In this haunting picture of Jesus, fastened to a cross and assailed in mockery, we see proof of the amazing difference between God's way and everything which men consider their goal or conceive of as being God's way. There's no self-defense from Jesus, no effort to get even or get in the final word, no attempt to preserve at least a modicum of dignity and pride. Jesus surrenders in total vulnerability to the malevolence and violence of the world to fulfill the Father's will. And so for our application, I have a couple of different points here, observations here. That segues right into our first point of application. We have the opportunity to see the example of Christ doing the will of the Father in the face of absolute suffering. Regardless of cost, Jesus died, rose, and ascended to justify those who are his. 
but he also did that to send the Spirit to indwell those who are his so that we might live in victory over sin and Satan. In other words, he allowed for us by defeating death, defeating Satan, defeating sin, allowed us an opportunity to overpower and overcome the sin that is within us, to break those chains. He allows us ultimately to follow the Father's will. In a depraved state, can we follow the, can we follow the Father's will? No. But once we are justified and that gift of the Spirit comes within us, we now have the example of Christ by the Spirit's working within us, understanding what he did, which was follow the Father's will against all opposition, all suffering, and through human mentality, human wisdom, shouldn't have. Shouldn't have had to go through that as the king of the universe, and yet he did following the Father's will. So I challenge you, I exhort you to see that as the example that it is knowing that we have the spirit within us by this very sacrifice that we've seen, we have the spirit within us to carry us through to work and live out the Father's will. And that will is evidence to us in scripture. There's not something special or miraculous or some sort of special meaning that we have to have or voice. Everything we need to know about the Father's will is right here. And the Spirit works in us to understand that. Second point of application is let us look to the person and work of Christ and not look for a sign. The chief priest at the very end of Christ's life, after seeing everything that he had went through, still asked for a sign. They, they missed the fact that it is Christ himself, the suffering servant, who is what they needed. They wanted a sign instead. Look to Christ. Rest in him. Nothing more is needed outside of him. We have been given all we need for faith and practice and the revelation of Christ in Scripture. It is him and him alone that we need. We rest in him. Don't look for signs. Don't seek other things. Seek Christ. And he endured all this for the sake of you and I. Our sin is what caused this to be needed, and he endured it in full submission to the Father's will. Look to him. Look to him. And the third point is very similar to what we talked about last week. You'll hear this recurring theme throughout Mark chapter 15. But we must understand the gravity of sin as seen in the suffering of Christ. We must understand the gravity of sin. Because the cost of our sin is why he endured what we saw today. And what we saw last week. And what we saw the week before that. And what we'll see next week. It is our sin that put him there. And yet, through all that suffering, as I mentioned earlier, he endured it for the sake of those whom the Father gave him, according to the Father's will. And I would give you a hearty, all hail, King Christ. All hail, the crucified King. For only in him could that be accomplished. Only in him do we find salvation. Only in him do we find rest from our sin. Only in him do we find the strength to be sanctified through the work of the Spirit. Only in him will we one day bow as every knee and every tongue confesses who he is. We will have that relationship with him where we perfectly see him in glory without the taint of our flesh. Only in him do we have that hope of rescue from a depraved, sin-filled world. All hail the crucified king. So in conclusion, Mark has shown us Jesus as the Messiah with his reference to the king of the Jews and his details about the royal mockery and the soldiers. But remember that, that Mark's overarching point as we've talked throughout his gospel is that he is revealing him as divine. He doesn't overemphasize one or the other, but his main point is the divinity of Christ. And so next week, I want to, to whet your appetite of sorts to, to 
finally get to come after all of our weeks in Mark, we finally get to the pinnacle verse in all of Mark, Mark 15, 39, next week, when a centurion who is standing there witnessing all of this sees Jesus breathe his last and then triumphantly says, truly this man was God's son. And so we've seen his messiahship. We've seen what he went through to be the savior. And next week we will see him raised up as the son of God that even a centurion can't deny. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the beauty of your sacrifice, the beauty of your example of following your will, regardless of the cost, regardless of our own will and desires. Lord, please, by your grace, give us the spirit to do the same. Help us to understand the cost of sin and the brutality and mockery of the king of the universe. Help us to echo all week, all hail the crucified king. That we might be in awe of what you sacrificed for those whom you were given. Help us to rest in you and the completed work as we will see next week. Help us to be eager about looking together as a body at the Redeemer King who tore that curtain that we might have access to you. We love you and praise you. In your holy name I pray, amen.